Thank you for listening to The Luminous Mind. Remember to subscribe to our channel so you won't miss any of our inspiring content. Here is episode number 124, our first anniversary special. We've learned more about learning in the last five years than we have in the last 5,000 years, and yet our educational systems have either ignored or for the most part just bypassed this idea that we know how we learn and it looks a whole lot more like a playground than a classroom. Benjamin Franklin once said, do not curse the darkness, rather light a candle instead. If you're ready to set your mind on fire, then prepare yourself for The Luminous Mind with your host, Rebecca Bowman. Today's fire starter is Dr. Rich Melheim. Dr. Rich is an educational systems pioneer, publisher, record producer, international preschool designer, and student of the neurology of early learning. With a doctorate in semiotics, a branch of linguistics, philosophy that studies meaning, Dr. Rich launched a preschool incubator project in the U.S. and India and is now on the verge of launching in Ethiopia, Egypt, and China. Using brain scan technology as a starting point and music, dance, theater, and art at the core of the educational delivery, Rich Learning engages brain-based learning on arts-based platforms. His philosophy is outlined online at richlearning.com in his new book, Rich Learning, and with a video of results online at richlearning.com. Well, welcome, Dr. Rich. Great to be with you today. I am excited to finally interview Dr. Rich. He was a listener request, and so I had never heard about Rich Learning until one of my listeners cued me in, so I'm excited to learn more about your educational philosophy. It seems like we're talking a lot about early education right now in our nation, <laughs> and it's kind yeah. of an all over the world, but why don't, before we get into that, briefly tell us a little bit more about yourself. Well, I was a bored dyslexic kid who had to go to special reading class when I was little, Teachers noticed that my eyes were scanning way down the page when my words were still uh, being jumbled and mumbled up front, and they had to tell me, slow down, slow (laughs) down. So I had to learn how to read. I did have a mother who was a teacher who read to me every night, so I had a great imagination. And actually, even to my college days and my doctoral work, I still ended up filling notebooks full of pictures rather than words in order to remember the pictures. It wasn't until I was past 50 that I found out that I was dyslexic. (laughs) And uh, some would say I don't have ADD. I have ADD, D, 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 D. So (laughs) I might have had multiple learning problems, but I've always been fascinated by learning and especially learning to learn. And so that's where I began with our education projects. That's great. And he has a wonderful video on his website that kind of explains that. And I'm hoping he'll go into that a little bit. We talked about, you know, learning disabilities or learning styles. What is the inspiration behind your work? And what is your feeling about learning challenges among students? Well, back when Gardner did the multiple intelligences years ago, he talked about children learning in different ways. Some are a little more visual, some are a little more aurals, some are a little more kinesthetic or they have to touch things. But what we've learned in the last probably 10 years since the brain scan technology has allowed us a window into the learning brain, we can actually watch a brain learn and grow as it's learning and growing. We can decipher which techniques of learning light up and hook up most of the brain. And the Hebb's law is a a neuron, neurons that fire together, wire together. The parts of your brain that you hook together end up helping build a multi-layer neural highway for more information, for more attention and more retention. And even Gardner today doesn't believe in the original Gardner stuff. It's not that one person is more visual and one person is more aural and one person is more kinesthetic. Everybody learns better when all of the intelligences are put together as opposed to one. If you just take the the amount of raw information that come through your eyes, for instance, so much more of the brain is dedicated to visual than aural. 
if you add a picture to a class or a lesson today and 72 hours later test the kids, 65% of the kids will be able to tell you about the lesson versus 10% if all you do is add a picture. And the neurology of that is your ears at maximum bandwidth can absorb about 10,000 bits of information per second, 10,000. But your eyes can absorb 7 billion bits of information a second, 10,000 wow. through your ears, 7 billion through your eyes. If you take away four zeros, a picture isn't worth a thousand words, it's worth 700,000 words. Everybody learns better if you're visual. Now, if you use music as a learning technique, you can always remember something so much faster, learn it faster and remember longer if you put a song to it. Uh, the, we study the neurology of music. The best friend of our project is Dr. Annie Patel, who's at Tufts University. I met him when he was at the Neuroscience Institute. He wrote the book Music, Language, and the Brain. Dr. Annie Patel, Music, Language, and the Brain. And he will tell you how much of the brain lights up and fires together and wires together if you're learning with music. If all you did was look at the amount of attention and retention you get of music versus talking, you'd never talk again as a teacher. You'd just sing. You'd use that asset. If you look at motion and movement and what that does to learning, Dr. John Rady at Harvard is our favorite neurologist on exercise. His book, Spark, the Revolutionary Science of Exercise in the Brain, will basically tell you you should throw away your desks in a classroom and you should be moving 90% of the time instead of sitting 90% of the time because music movement, movement gives you oxygen to your brain much more and oxygen of course makes you attentive. Movement gives you glucose which is the uh, molecule that builds the glial cells. It builds more capacity in the brain so you have more attention and more retention if you're moving versus sitting. What we did in Rich Learning at richlearning.com, you can watch some of the results, is we put music and motion and emotion and art together with theater. We threw four things together that really don't cost anything in our experiment. It doesn't cost a nickel to sing. It doesn't cost a nickel to dance. It doesn't cost a nickel to act or play. And with art, you know, we did some of our art supplies with sticks and rocks and twigs in India because we didn't have enough art supplies. Although we are talking to Crayola right now about wouldn't they want to be the sponsor of an educational revolution across the world. The most effective tools you have as an educator don't cost anything. You don't need a computer. You don't need a science lab. You don't need fancy supplies. And so as we do our testing, we did our first testings in the U.S., cleaned up the results. We did our second testings in India, taught 10 cities worth of people in India, cleaned up the results. We're getting ready now to go to Ethiopia in February and to Egypt in April and then hopefully China by summer. Most of what we do is intuitive for anybody who's spent any time with three, four and five year olds who are running and dancing and singing and watch me, mommy. But it's not intuitive to professional educators who've learned how to teach in one certain way that is counterproductive to the neurology we've learned in the last 10 years with brain scan technology. That's the intro. You said so many little sound bites that I want to touch on <laughs> because it does make sense. I mean, we see children at a young age. Let's kind of go into the early learning and then how we can kind of incorporate. Like you said, those are natural things for little children to do. All of a sudden, we want to sit them down at a desk. I mean, what are some of the results that you've seen if we can take kind of that early learning of how they naturally do it and kind of implement it into, you know, our later school years? What does that look like? Neurologists would tell you that at birth, the brain is more receptive and it's learning faster and it's growing more neurons. In fact, in the womb, the brain is growing 250,000 neurons a second. Wow. <laughs> or a minute, I'm sorry. This little brain and the younger, the better is learning how to learn. It's shaping, it's forming, it's growing, it's adding billions of neurons and then pruning away the ones that aren't being used. And the earlier you start anything, you know, talk about language, the earlier you want to try to learn a language, you want to learn Mandarin Chinese. I didn't start learning Mandarin until I was 50. I don't speak it very well. 
But if you start early, the brain is absolutely amazing in how it can shape, form, reform, build, grow, and add capacity. Uh, when it comes to learning spelling, when it comes to learning words, when it comes to literacy, when it comes to learning how to observe the world, which then leads to better science, uh, when it comes to math, any of those things, if, if you harness the intuitive power of that curious young brain, which is starving to learn, and you decide we're simply going to teach the way the brain learns instead of sit them down in a chair, you know, to put a three-year-old, a four-year-old, a five-year-old in a chair and say, sit still while I instill, is just counterproductive to the neurology the physiology, the sociology, and the psychology of learning. And yet we have one mindset in our mind about how we should teach. And a good classroom is a quiet classroom where all 40 kids are sitting politely in their desks, listening with rapt attention to what the teacher is saying. And that's just bad neurology. We've learned more in the last five years, thanks to advanced brain scan technology, to PET scans and fMRIs, which watch the brain real time learn. We've learned more about learning in the last five years than we have in the last 5,000 years. And yet our educational systems have either ignored or for the most part just bypassed this idea that we know how we learn and it looks a whole lot more like a playground than a classroom. Yeah. Every child is just starving to learn. You can tell that from the time that they're born to their first year, the things that they've learned just within that year are astounding. But like you said, I mean, we're moving our education for those younger, those early learning into this rigorous, you know, more like looks like the classroom. You know, we want them to read at three and we want this and that. So tell us how we can keep those natural things that those young kids are doing implemented into their learning, what results have you seen? Well, if you go to richlearning.com, you'll see a three-and-a-half-year-old after four weeks teaching a four-year-old how to spell apple, banana, carrot, ant, bee, cat. And this is a little girl whose first language is Tamil, and she's teaching a four-year-old in English those words with our techniques. Wow. Uh, you'll see a little girl named Pollock who after... Uh, seven or after eight weeks, she's also three and a half. After eight weeks, can spell words that like adventurous, brave, confident, uh, other words. And to me, literacy is the key out of poverty. Yeah. Uh, literacy opens your world for the rest of your life. Literacy builds a multi layer neural highway in the brain, connecting imagination to sight, to sound, to creativity. And if you use music, you're a thousand times better off than if you're just talking to a kid. If you get them out of their desks and let them bounce around, don't stop them from bouncing around, invite them to bounce around so they have more oxygen in their brain. I, I say it's a no brainer for anybody with half a brain. Why <laughs> wouldn't you want oxygen in their brain? Oxygen is the molecule that busts right through the brain blood barrier and gives you attention. It fuels the brain. Why wouldn't you want the molecule glucose, which you get when you're moving around, which builds the, the nerve cells? Why wouldn't you want the brain fertilizer in your brain that you get when exercising? The brain fertilizer goes by the letters BDNF, if you want to Google it or connect it. This is from John uh, Radiate at Harvard in his book, Spark. Uh, the, the brain fertilizer you get when you exercise builds more nerve cells. It builds more connections on the nerve cells. And it builds more receptors on the connections on the nerve cells. It's like you've got an eight-lane highway instead of a four-lane highway for learning when you're moving, not when you're sitting. So we take those things that the three-year-old normally does in life, and we simply let them do and be what they love to do and be. And that attacks, attaches to the emotional center of the brain. Once you have the emotional center of the brain, awake and alert and wanting to be with you, all the gatekeepers and the rest of the brain break down and you have a, a multi-layer highway to learning. So simply by playing, by singing, by dancing, by, you know, watch me, mommy, by letting them do those things that the three and four year old love to do anyway, you are giving them everything neurologically that they need to learn and develop a thicker, healthier brain. And physiologically, you're putting those things into the brain that give them attention and retention. 
it's intuitive if you've if you've ever had a three and a four year old and just played with them and try to keep up with them. It's not intuitive if you've got a college education that tells you the proper way to learn is to sit in a desk and listen to what the teacher is saying. Yeah, I'm actually trying to find that quote. I saw it somewhere on your website about that same thing that you were just talking about. It's wonderful. I'm like, this is going to be part of this podcast meme, but I can't find it. So we'll have to talk about later. But so give us just your overall, I mean, we've really gone through kind of in depth, but what do you want our audience to come away with about how your paradigm has been changed about learning with your time and with experience? You said that, you know, you came upon this like at age, what, 50? Is that what you said? (laughs) It was actually later than that. I I didn't realize I was dyslexic until Reading my favorite uh, literacy expert is Marianne Wolf at Tufts University. Uh, Marianne runs the early reading lab at Tufts, and she's the author of the New York Times bestseller Prost and the Squid, which is all about how do you go from little neurons firing to poetry and you know understanding reading and literacy at its depth. And as I was reading Marianne's book, I Prost and the Squid, I started to realize that oh yeah, I had to go to special class when I was a kid. It it escaped me. Maybe it was my brain trying not to remember those painful (laughs) times. But it wasn't until then that I realized I had a reading problem. And as I read more and more about dyslexia, there are many different kinds of dyslexia. I realized that I was living in pictures and and seeing in pictures. In order to read a book, it was painful. I, I literally had to take a pen to a book or I couldn't remember anything I could read a page and not remember anything I had just read unless I circled and highlighted and made notes and all of that. And Marianne's uh, insights into how the little child learns how to read, how they learn how to see, translate uh, symbols, which are letters and and words, and turn them into meaning, uh, that led me into this whole study of, is there a better way, a faster way, an easier way, a more intuitive way? that we can learn to read and learn to learn. My doctorate is in semiotics, which is a branch of linguistic philosophy that studies symbols and wonders why does anything mean anything. I actually started my dissertation under the the title, The Meaning of Meaning in a Post-Gutenberg Neo-Google World. (laughs) And it, thanks to Marianne anyway, it became apparent to me that before literacy, we were reading symbols and translating them to meaning. The brain was already reading symbols. If you saw a footprint in the snow and it was a deer footprint, it meant food to you. If you saw a panther footprint, it might have meant I'm food if I don't get out of here. (laughs) So we've been using symbols and translating them to meaning. In a preliterate world, we had uh, orators who could tell you a story for three hours. You could memorize poems, long, long epic poems like the Iliad and the Odyssey. And, and Jewish children would memorize the whole Torah with chanting with the rabbi, the whole, you know, the five books of Moses. The whole thing was memorized. We had this amazing capacity to memorize and to learn. And with music, even you... Uh, when you were a teenager, probably knew thousands of songs and played them over and over and over again. The brain had amazing capacity when it was taught with the story, taught with the music. Before literacy, you would tell your stories in the church with stained glass windows, and you know you could tell a whole story in a picture, and the the meaning was attached to the picture. And it may be that the post-Gutenberg world is a lot more like the pre-Gutenberg world when it comes to learning. Maybe we have to go back to story, to music, to pictures, to drama, and those things which you don't need a book, you don't need a word, you don't need a letter to learn. But my question is, what if you use those media, which are so natural and healthy and light up the human brain, What if you use those media to teach literacy, to teach math, to teach science, and embed everything you want to teach in those media which are so brain-friendly and light up the whole brain? I think a child can learn to read very early. In fact, go to richlearning.com, you'll see amazing results. I think a a child can learn 
to think more creatively and, and innovatively and, and, uh, and with teamwork, which are all skills that we will need for the 21st century, not just learning how to you know, spout facts back, but learning how to learn, learning creativity, learning innovation, learning teamwork, and then we can leverage the technology that's available or the, all the information we need is at our fingertips, but it won't just be information we're getting off the web. It'll be information that helps us then build and create and be innovative. I think the earlier we start, the better. Uh, I decided to be a preschool teacher in order to learn this with the kids. I, <laughs> in my first test in America, I did eight weeks as a preschool teacher. I lost five pounds. We went to India and I did another eight weeks as a preschool teacher. I lost 18 pounds. <laughs> it's a very good weight loss technique to teach in this way. I go to um, Ethiopia here in February. I might lose 36. To, I might lose. I might be gone after my fourth or fifth <laughs> method. But it's an absolute blast. It's intuitive, and if you simply teach the way the young brain learns best and employ the tools the young brain loves the most, it, like I say, it's a no-brainer for anybody with half a brain. And they can learn all those embedded facts that you want them to have but they'll know what to do with the facts and they'll be able to create with the facts rather than just regurgitate the facts. Well, and my brain is just firing for the possibilities. You know, right now in our education system, it seems like we are labeling kids with this learning disability or this learning disability, when in fact, it just sounds like if we can hit all of those senses, we wouldn't have anyone with a learning disability. You know, that every child has the ability to learn when we offer that type of education to them absolutely um, yeah and, you know leonardo da vinci and einstein and edison would have all been drugged today been drugged so fast they were all thought of as dunces anyway and or, or dunces anyway and today they would have been on ritalin at five and we would have never had the beauty depth and wonder of a whole brain thinker some of the drugs have been gifts to people who have you know focus problems and different things so i don't want to talk down yeah all of that but John Rady at Harvard believes almost all of ADD, ADHD can be helped, mitigated, if not cured, if we simply get out of our seats, out of our desks, and do what we've been doing for most of the history of humanity. For most of the history of humanity, we've been moving all day long, otherwise we would have been eaten. Rather than, <laughs> this, is, this is from John, he's absolutely brilliant. Rather than sitting all day long, I mean, we were not built to sit all day long. Yeah. We were built to move. And you think of the problems that we're facing, especially as we age with a sedentary lifestyle, not just the diabetes and the arterial uh, problems and the strokes and the heart problems that are accentuated by all this. Think of how many billions and hundreds of billions of dollars it is costing us to live a sedentary lifestyle yeah. if we would simply say, no, we're going to move most of our learning time rather than sit most of our learning time. Th this is a matter of immense proportion, not just to the, the aging of America where dementia and all those other problems can be mitigated, if not cured, by having a healthier lifestyle and brain. But it's a financial problem. It's a national security problem. It's an education problem. And none of it has to happen if we simply say we are going to get out of our seats and we're going to do what for most of human history we've been doing. And we're going to let the kid jump and run and play. In fact, we're going to invite that. And let's just see what happens down the road to health and wealth and you know life quality and all those things as we age as a society. Well, I want to definitely help you do that. I was reading actually this morning, it was making me really sad that 10,000 children under the age of three are on ADHD or ADHD. And like you said, I don't want to discount what that medication can do, but definitely, you know, I was thinking about this interview that I was going to do with you and how important that movement is. Before we go on, let's listen to this message. Hello, Firestarters. First off, I just want to thank everybody for listening to The Luminous Mind. We have now been producing podcasting content for a whole year. Something that started off as just a goal for 30 interviews. I have just finished my 130 interview today, and I'm just excited that we have been able to really 
take this message worldwide and to be able to have the opportunity to have you as our listeners. As a way of saying thank you, many of our past Firestarter contributors have donated gifts and prizes that you as subscribers to our podcast, and if you're already a subscriber, if you haven't subscribed, definitely go on and subscribe to our podcast, which will qualify you for the drawings. And then if you have subscribed, please write us a review and send us that review through our email at contact at theluminousmind.net contact at the luminous mind.net and we would love to see that review and give those prizes to people that subscribe to our podcast so please go ahead and first off go to our website the luminous mind.net and become part of our email list so that you can find out about all these cool prizes that we will be giving away throughout the month it's going to be a very exciting month and once again we say thank you for listening to the luminous mind Let us know how we can help you so that we can continue to light minds on fire and change the paradigm of education. Welcome back to The Luminous Mind with Dr. Rich Melheim and Rich Learning. Show us kind of with words, <laughs> because we don't have them pictures or anything, but kind of verbalize what your classrooms look like and how you've set those up. Uh, the first thing we did is we throw out all the chairs and desks. And our host in India, most of the professional teachers were absolutely upset and flabbergasted. This is not how we teach properly. In <laughs> India... 40 kids sit in rows, one kid at a time goes to the board to write to the answer the teacher has. And oftentimes, if they don't get it right, they get hit with a stick. Oh, that's just what I want. A whole bunch of tense kids who are trying to perform at four years old. And, you know, when you're under stress, your body produces cortisol, the stress hormone. Cortisol blocks the sleep hormone melatonin, and you get most of your memory restoration and solidification in sleep, so it blocks your sleep. When you're under stress, your blood vessels constrict, which means you're not getting as much oxygen to the brain. When you're under stress, your immune system doesn't function properly. I mean, you're just making all these problems when you create a stressful classroom. And yet, if everybody is supposed to sit in a chair, not move, not have any oxygen to their brain, Chairs are the enemy of the brain. Let me put it that way. And so we threw out our chairs. The second thing we did is we put a foamy floor in the room. You can buy these um, about two inch thick pieces that look like puzzle pieces that snap together and you can put your whole floor into foam. So jumping and dancing and once we go you know, down on the floor and wiggle around like bugs or whatever we're studying, All of that is set up with your architecture. We filled the walls just with the pictures and the art and the number and the animals that we were going to do that week. And so we weren't focused on 3,000 things. The average American preschool is filled with clutter. And clutter is the enemy of the distracted mind. Clutter is the enemy of the ADD, ADHD mind. People walk into a classroom and it's got all these thousand toys and thousand pictures on the walls and everything. And they think, oh, this is really a rich environment. Wrong. This is an environment that's going to be a distractive environment. And if a kid has distraction problems anyway or attention problems anyway, you are defeating the purpose. Focus on the handful of things you want to focus on and focus on them until they're mastered, then add one more thing, then add one more letter, then one more number or one picture. Uh, What we did with our day is we um, broke into sections where we did our opening and our, our language pieces first thing in the morning. We did a letter each week, a color each week, a number each week, an animal each week, and the animal had to do with the letter so if the, this week is week A, we're learning about ants and we're learning about adventure and we're learning about apples. So all we have in the space are those things that we really want to focus on over and over and over again. After the vocabulary and, the, and that part of language, we added speaking in English and in uh, Hindi in our Indian experiments 
and in the regional language, which in Chennai is the language of Tamil. So we taught uh, how to say hello, teacher, hello, children. We taught one red ant in three different languages. In our American experiment, we spoke in English, Mandarin, and Spanish, which are the three languages that in America will be really helpful to learn over the next <laughs> 20 years. In, in Ethiopia, we'll speak in English and in two of the um, main languages of Ethiopia, which are Oromo and Amharic. In uh, Egypt, we'll speak in Arabic, in English, and we haven't decided yet if we're going to teach Mandarin or French. It's up to them which of the other languages they want. But after the unveiling of the language in the morning, then we go into specific languages. We also added American Sign Language in our tests. We'll do Arabic Sign in Egypt. Uh, because when you add motion, when you add muscle memory, you add quantum leap more learning, attention, and retention power when you're teaching the letters, for instance, the numbers, the colors, and the animals. You'll see at richlearning.com a little girl, three-and-a-half-year-old Pollock, spelling with her hands. When I ask her to spell a word, often her little hand will start moving to the letter before her brain and her words come out of her mouth. She That's will spell apple, A-P-P-L-E, and you'll notice her hand, the fraction of a second before she says A, her hand is already doing the A. Her, before she says P, her hand is already doing the P. Muscle memory is the most attentive and retentive form of learning you have as a human being. And so why wouldn't you use the most attentive and retentive learning if you're going to try to teach something? After the languages, the, the English and the languages, we go to a break and we sing a little song, body break, body break, water body and a healthy snack, water break, body break, everybody move now, come right back. The brain has to have diffused time. It has to have break time in order to get memory consolidation. You cannot just go focus, 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 focus. It just doesn't work. Huh. It's like and here we time. are getting rid of recess in schools. It's, <laughs> well, it's just stupid. It, if it, say you take a, a bottle of water in a teacup and you say, can this whole bottle fit in the teacup? The answer is yes, but not all at once. You pour in a little bit, you drink it. You pour in a little bit, you drink it. You pour in a little bit, you drink it. You have to absorb what you've just learned or you might as well just keep pouring and pouring and pouring. There's not going to be any more water yeah. going in that glass. It will flow out all over and be wasted. That's a, that's a visual you can use if you're bringing a group of uh, parents together or a group of teachers together. We will pour in a little, and then we'll do something with it, and then we'll take a break. I got to go pee. By the way, <laughs> if they run into the bathroom all the time, they're getting more oxygen and glucose to the brain if they have to run to the bathroom. So that, that's all good. So we take a body break. Then we do our math. And we do our math again with music and with art. And, you know, let's get our bodies in the shape of a triangle. Let's get our bodies in the shape of a square or a hexagon or a pentagon. We take everything we can do to put that in with music, dance, theater, and art. Everything we learn has those four arts. Music, art, dance, art, theater, and visual arts. Then we take our lunch break and we try to do a food of the week that goes with the letter of the week. So apples, bananas, carrots, dates, that sort of thing. We take a nap. And in most of the developing world, they have gotten rid of nap time. Oh, that's just a waste of time. And in preschools that are so focused, 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 they get rid of nap time. Stupid. If you simply Google, <laughs> I would like a nap time. <laughs> and it's so, my dad took a nap every day of his life at about two o'clock in the afternoon. And he was so productive. He was just crazy productive. And if you Google the health of naps, uh, University of California, San Diego, Sarah Bednick and other people, they will tell you what happens in the brain when you take a nap. And there's a certain amount of memory consolidation that happens in sleep that just does not happen if you go, 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 go. So if your goal is to have better memory consolidation of what you're learning, of course you take a nap. The, the jury is out on how long a nap should be at different ages. They recommend different minutes for different ages. But I like at least 20 minutes. Um, I like to be able to go uh, into rapid eye movement and slow wave movement sleep. Uh, if you can do 40 minutes, it's even better. You know, but you decide. We're all experimenting here. And we'll, three years from now, we'll probably learn what works best. And what worked best 
in China may not be what works best in India, may not what works best in Peoria, but we're doing enough experimenting that I think we'll learn what standard three, four, five-year-old uh, works best. After lunch, we do our sciences and our health, and you're alert again, and you try to do uh, experiments. You sing it, you dance it, you art it, and then another body break, and then we do some of our theater arts and our visual arts, and we always do storytelling at the end of the day, uh, and the story ties in the animal of the week, the letter of the week, the virtue of the week. We always do some kind of a virtue like bravery or confidence or forgiveness, encouragement. That's all in the curriculum that we're developing. Kind of that, if you have a core, you can grasp onto things better, you know, like a core understanding of something. Yeah. Awesome. So a day would be focused with your Englishes and your languages, and then a break, focus with your maths and your geometries, and a lunch and a nap, focus with your science and your health, and then a a break, and then your story and tie everything together. That's basically what a day is. I like 20 minutes of direct focused learning, moving and such with the teacher, 20 uh, minutes of student directed learning, and then 20 minutes of a break. And then on and on again, if you're thinking of an hour broken into three pieces. Yeah. All right. So I know you talked about how inexpensive this type of curriculum is, but we do have a lot of parents that are necessarily, you know, they're pulling their children out and they're trying to homeschool them. And like I said, your name was given to me by, I know, a person that does homeschool. You know, do you have any resources or things like that that you sell that maybe might help like the average parent kind of institute this type of school into their own home? Is that a possibility? Uh, this, will, this will sound really weird to you, but not yet. <laughs> <laughs> I we mean, it does seem simple, read. but the songs, I'm like, I'm trying to think of how could I create, you know, songs. We, <laughs> we, we wrote over 500 early learning songs with 36 musicians. We did 30 (laughs) math songs, 30 science songs, 30 health songs, 30 virtue songs, 30 spelling songs, 30 phonics songs, but I'm not gonna let anybody hear them until we've polished and repolished. So I'm sorry, I can't can't make any money off your people today. Darn it. Uh, (laughs) We just got back from Egypt where we have uh, one of the national treasures of Egypt starting to write the Arabic songs with us. He literally quit the London uh, Royal Theater to come back to Egypt to start this project. Wow. We just got back from Ethiopia. A week ago today, I talked to an amazing Ethiopian musician to start working on, on uh, that. We have our first 30 Chinese songs done, but we have to test them before we, you know, it's kind of ready, fire, aim. We got a little bit ready. We're going to fire in the test. We'll clean them up. And then if they just want to go to richlearning.com and follow us and then put a note in their outlook that um, three months from now, come back and talk to us again. <laughs> or if you want to email me personally, it's rich at rich learning uh, or David, who's our COO, David at rich learning and say, you know, put me on a list. I'd love to, you know, see or maybe even test some of your stuff after it's ready. Yeah, but well, definitely I'm sorry, put me on. I, 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 gonna... <laughs> I, I can't sell you anything today. I'm going to get on that list, too, because it just okay. sounds, I'm just all fired up about it. It sounds neat. Let's kind of go into, I mean, you talked about how you've done a school here, but you've also, it sounds like you've gone to Asia and Africa. Why did you hit those areas, and what are you seeing there? You know, why do you feel like that they might be more interested in this art-based learning music platform? If you look at the world demographics right now, one half of the world's population lives in six countries in the world. One half of the world's population lives in six countries. Wow. China, 1.4 billion. India, 1.3 billion. United States, Indonesia, uh, Brazil, and Pakistan. Those six countries have 3.6 billion people. And the rest of the world has 3.6 billion people. So if all you did was today, I want to go to the three biggest markets, you'd go to India, China, and the United States. It's pretty easy. That's a good market. Free school business in America, I think the last I checked was a $37 billion business. And only one, the the largest provider, Knowledge Universe, only has 3% of the market. 
So just from a raw business perspective, there's a lot of room to be made in uh, early learning in American business. The two fastest growing business franchises in China and India are preschool. <laughs> the preschool, <laughs> the innovators of the year, the entrepreneurs of the year happen to be in China and India. China just eliminated its one baby policy. And so the market over the next five years for early learning, right now today, half of the people who want to get their child in preschool and have the money can't even get on a list in preschool in China. So that's an amazing business. And in India, there's just great fast growing franchises. Some of them are setting up 17 preschools a month and can't keep up with demand. Wow. So we have plans for two things. We have plans for a nonprofit that provides access to excellence in early learning to kids who never could afford excellence, kids who couldn't dream of excellence. That, uh, the Rich Learning International is a foundation that is now headed by uh, Dr. William C. Nelson. Bill came out of retirement to take on this task. Bill is the uh, former CEO of the largest American scholarship fund in history, scholarshipamerica.org. Bill, as a young man, marched with Dr. King and helped put the uh, Selma to Atlanta march in place in 1965. He was a Fulbright scholar in Germany. He went on to be a college president and then over 17 years built scholarshipamerica.org. He uh, retired and became pastor of all things. He retired <laughs> again and became our CEO. And we're just so thankful for Bill Nelson and his work. His goal will be to uh, raise enough money with our Rich Learning International Foundation that we can take young adults from America into kind of a Peace Corps, AmeriCorps for the Arts experiment, where they'll give two years of their lives singing and dancing and doing art and theater in third world settings. And then at the end, our goal will be to erase their college loans after they've given two years of their life. So if you're a young adult who wants to come with me to Ethiopia in February, we will get going and then we might send you to Egypt and China after that. In fact, we'll be recruiting in January, so whenever this comes out, email me at rich at richlearning dot and we'll uh, talk to you about that. The first thing then is to create a nonprofit that does all kinds of good around the world. Africa today is 1.2 billion people, but by 2050 it will be 2.4 billion people. And they're and some by, of our poorest people in the world. Correct? And by 2100, it'll be four. 0.8 billion people. Africa, three out of five babies born in the world will be born in Africa by 2050, according to UNICEF. Three out of five babies. So not only will we work US, China, and India, but we want to start in Africa and we want to do great work with young people and poor people. Ethiopia and Egypt are the second and third largest countries in Africa. Ethiopia will double in size by 2050. They've got all kinds of great kids, all kinds of great possibilities, but all kinds of poverty. And literacy is the key out of poverty. I just met with the president of Ethiopia, and our host, uh, Dr. Gomeshes Buba, is the founder of Lead Star University. He started a university three years ago, and in August, I got to speak at the graduation of his first 500 MBAs. He knows that if we work on early learning and get people great connections, great literacy, friends around the world, we can shape the future of Ethiopia, which is sitting between Sudan and Somalia, two very dangerous places today. My message to the president of Ethiopia was either we seed or we concede. Either we seed the kind of future we want, starting as early as possible, or we will concede to a future in Africa that nobody wants. Yeah. And we, we concede great things and great fun, great literacy, great knowledge, but we have to start very early. We start there in February, and we need 20 young adults from America to come with us. I'm looking for singers, dancers, artists, and theater people who want to go and have some fun. And we'll pay them a little stipend, pay for their airfare, pay for their expenses and everything. And they will become the people who help seed everything we want to do in Africa. 
Egypt's the second largest country in Africa, and Egypt just had its uh, second revolution. Egypt has all kinds of great people, musicians, writers, artists, dancers. Egypt used to be the center of world education. Alexandria was the center yeah, of world <laughs> education. It had the greatest library in the world. And yet today, Egypt is in trouble and in great danger. Half of the children in Egypt are growing up in poverty. Many of them have no option for schools. So we want to create great things in Egypt. Our partner there is a group called Hands Together. Hani Wadi Assad is our host there. Hani has this nonprofit that wants to do wonderful things with kids living in poverty. And if we can connect literacy, music, art, dance, Egypt can be the health of the Middle East. Egypt can send kids to uh, young adults and musicians to refugee camps to give them a great option, a great alternative to some of the bad stuff that they might be learning otherwise. Yeah. Uh, people from the UAE, uh, people from Saudi Arabia, uh, people from Jordan, you know, places that are inundated with refugees today, if they can be healthy and positive and, and fun and have a good option for education and great friends in the West, we will shape the kind of country that we want. We will shape the kind of Africa that we want. We will shape the kind of world. And to me, you know, the saying, it's better to light a candle than to curse the darkness. If we can light some little candles using this rich learning concept and then make great friends around the world. If we can have a shaping, a geopolitical shaping of, of Africa with great kids, great literacy, great education, this is not just something for your kid. This is something for your grandkids' future. So that's what the Rich Learning Group is going to be working on. And with Dr. Bill Nelson and Hani Assad and our friend Dr. Buba in Ethiopia, our friend Wen Wen from China, our friend David from India. We just have lots of fun stuff we're going to do. And hopefully it'll be a bigger thing than just teaching a couple kids how to sing and dance. As we end, I mean, we kind of discussed what the geopolitical uh, life could look like with a really great education for these kids. Why don't we just reiterate that? And then please just reiterate your contact information of how our guests can get in touch with you. But, you know, what your hope, I mean, you've kind of discussed it, but, but really nail it in there of what that geopolitical ending can look like for us with this education. You bet. Tip O'Neill, who was Speaker of the House 20, 30 years ago, uh, said, all politics is local. People care first about what's happening to me, <laughs> what's happening to my kids. And in America, the very top earners have great options with great schools, with Montessori, with all kinds of good, uh, you know, kind of creme de la creme, primrose academies and such. But the middle... And the bottom don't always have great options. And the middle don't have great options if the kids are, are sitting in a chair all day instead of taking seriously what we now know the young brain is capable of doing and uh, how we learn best with more oxygen and glucose in our brain. So I would love to do stuff here and help shape the middle and especially access to excellence in inner city areas and rural poor Allendale County in South Carolina, for instance, one of the poorest counties in the United States. We'd love to do something there. South Carolina has the one of the big Google data centers, and you know maybe Google would like one in Charleston or in Berkeley County. You know Charleston had terrible racial things that were happening before. We can do so much good here in our own backyard, and if all politics is local, that's great. But our kids are going to grow up in a much more connected world and probably a much more dangerous world unless we decide we're going to do more than just take care of our own and build a castle around our own and a moat and a, and a, and a wall around our own. And, and so, then maybe not use guns and fire on our enemies, <laughs> right? Well, we have much better ammunition than bullets if we use fun, love, care, understanding, relationships, and friendships. There's not enough bullets in the world that can kill an idea. Only an idea can kill an idea. Only a powerful idea can destroy a dangerous. And love is always more powerful than hate. And positive is always more powerful than negative. And lighting a candle can get rid of darkness. It's said that all the darkness in the world cannot extinguish the light of one solitary candle. So what we want to do is create with our for-profit entity, Rich Learning Global, 
which would then create some products, some music, some art, the kind of stuff your people can buy, <laughs> media, cartoons, online education, subscription-based monthly, here's your preschool channel, all that kind of stuff, and franchises who, for people who can afford great stuff. We want to be able to help subsidize and fund, kind of like Tom's Shoes, where you buy one pair of shoes, you just gave away a pair of shoes, kind of like the One Laptop Per Child Project, buy a laptop and give one away. By the way, Marianne Wolf at Tufts, who's our favorite neurologist in literacy, was working on the One Laptop Per Child Project, which helped design third world laptops to kids. We want to create a for-profit partnership with nonprofit entities and with young adults uh, you know, the 18 to 28 year old musician, writer, artist, dancer from America who wants to use their gifts and talents for the good of the whole future and also wants an international experience where they're serving and giving and having fun while they're doing it. Uh, we want to create that kind of learning for the whole world and then just make a better place for all the, all the children of the world. If you think all the children are our children, because this world is our world. Let's do something good for our own. Yep, all politics is local. But then let's take our own and let's make a better world for all the children. That's at richlearning.com. All you'll see there is our India experiment and a little bit about what we're going to do in China. Over the next few months, we'll be putting up our Ethiopian and our Egyptian experiments there. Yeah, we are looking for some 18 to 28-year-old kids who want to go out and share their arts with the world and have a blast while they're, while they're doing it. Great. And that's at richlearning.com, right? That's at richlearning.com. <laughs> we'll just say it over and over again. So. Yeah. <laughs> Can't sell you a bunch of stuff. <laughs> I'll be mercenary some other day. Right now, we just want to do a whole lot of experiments and learn the best way to learn. Well, and what an information-packed podcast. I'm so grateful for your time. Thank you so much for coming on. I really hope that we can stay in touch and really, you know, spread this word. And then also, you know, as you come out with some of those products and, and that we can help to educate each child in a very fun and exciting way. So thank you so much. Great to be with you. I'll leave you with a parting thought. The word education comes from the Latin word to draw out. Educatio educare is literally to draw out, not to cram in. And if you just decide we're going to draw out all the best of the kids, we'll put some good stuff in, but then let them play with them, whether it's toys, numbers, songs, dances, colors, Put something good in and then draw out. That's where creativity, that's where innovation, and that's where true education happens. Not in the cramming in, in the drawing out. That's great. Thank you so much for your time, Dr. Rich. You bet. Take care. Thank you for listening to The Luminous Mind. To learn more about Dr. Rich and Rich Learning, go to our show notes at theluminousmind.net. Be sure to become a subscriber to our free email list and get our new monthly newsletter. Then check out our services tab to see how we can continue to assist you, our fire starters. Also, to help us continue with our production of inspiring content, go to the sponsor tab at theluminousmind.net for more information on sponsorship and affiliate programs. Like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter, Google+, and now Pinterest. Get our audio content by subscribing on YouTube, iTunes, and Stitcher. To help us grow, consider telling your friends about us. Leave us a review. Tell us how we can help you so together we can continue to light minds on fire and change the paradigm of education. 